we're going to talk about when God moves this morning, but I'll, I'll, spoiler alert. You know, we use the word revival and awakening pretty loosely. And uh, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm grateful when there are gatherings of people and there's baptisms and there's a turning to God. I'm, I'm very much appreciative of that. I, I work hard to see that happen wherever I'm engaged. When we start to talk about that on a broader scale, I'll tell you what to look for more than baptism numbers or the size of the audience. You want to start to look for the fruit of that. If it's a college campus, you want to watch, start to watch the fraternities and the sororities have fewer participants in their ungodly activities. If it's in a community, you want to watch the immoral behavior begin to deteriorate and the places where people gather for that to be less busy. You want to see the fruit of it and not just photographs of a few dozen of us going through religious rituals. And again, I've given my life to helping people make professions of faith and be baptized and gather for services. I believe in that. But the fruit of turning to God is reflected in the behavior of the culture. We won't have to have meetings to say, get the pornography out of the elementary libraries. The people with authority will be removing the books and reporting. That's what we're watching for. So your prayers matter. Amen? Amen? I would very, how many of you are willing to ha join me this week and pray that Friday and Saturday the Lord does something beyond us? Okay? Awesome. Our offertory prayer today. Gee, what could we pray for? There doesn't seem to be anything on the list, does there? We've been praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And we had a miracle last Saturday. We gathered for church on Saturday and that happened to be, it was Shabbat in Israel, which means everything is typically closed and shuttered for the most part. And there was a direct attack from Iran. I read a report last night, I won't read it to you again, but from an Israeli physicist that had worked in their defense systems. And he said for the, the, the number of missiles and drones, for the scale of the attack that was launched on Israel, and for it to have been unsuccessful because of the interception of that and because of their defense system, he said was, could not be explained on the basis of science. This was me quoting. He said the success rate they had was impossible without the imagination of God's sovereign intervention. And he said, in his words, not mine, he said it was a greater miracle than the victory in the Six-Day War or the War of Independence, and he likened it to the parting of the Red Sea. So, why don't you stand with me for our offertory prayer. If you're at home, put your bagel down. We're going to pray. I think we ought to thank the Lord that he's moving in the earth. You know, it's so easy to look at the darkness and get heated up. I'm far more encouraged about what we see God doing, keeping his promises, watching over his people. I can, I can hardly believe people are coming from 40 states to a conference to talk about how to let Jesus be more clearly presented in the world we live in. That's remarkable. That if you don't think it's remarkable, you haven't tried to gather a group of people lately. We're busy and we're addicted to entertainment. And what we're doing is not entertaining. And to see God moving in those ways, you should know we're living in the midst of something that is not normal. And so I think an appropriate response is to say, Lord, thank you. Doesn't mean our lives are perfect or we're without problems because that isn't true. We have problems in the world we live in. The brokenness is, is rather apparent. But Almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, is moving in our generation. And for some reason, in his providence, in his wisdom, he called your name and my name. Amen. He said, here's the baton. This is your season. You carry it for me. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? One day you and I'll see Peter and James and John and Gideon and a whole bunch of folks. And you'll say, oh, I know your story. I read about you in the book. And they'll say, well, tell me your story. We're working on it. We're working on it. We're not going to say, oh, I went to church a lot. Oh, it's awful. Preacher talked forever. 
You should see the outlines, micro print. <laughs> I don't think they will empathize with you. We have much to say thank you for. Amen? Amen. And if this morning you came and you're desperate, and there's a heaviness that is tangible around you, the best path I know towards freedom is taking a moment and say, God, I thank you that you watch over my life that you're close to the brokenhearted, that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. Lord, I don't feel like it, but thank you. The evidence isn't lined up yet where I can see it, but in you, I'm triumphant. Thank you. Lord, I'm battling fear. I've got a horrible diagnosis, but God, thank you that you're my protector. Amen. You created me. I say thank you today. Can we do that? Have you got your bagel down yet? Let's pray. Lord, thank you. We come today. I thank you for your church and the earth, that you calling men and women from every nation, race, language, and tribe to serve you and to honor you. We thank you for the great privilege of being included with that number. But I thank you for the good reports from Israel that in the midst of the hatred, the anti-Semitism and the murderous intent of others that you are keeping your promise and you're watching over the people of that land. I thank you for your love for the church, that you are preparing a bride without spot or wrinkle and that in your mercy, you're bringing conviction and you're shaking us Lord, to awaken us to see our reality that we might turn to you in humility, with the fear of God that has been absent in our hearts for too long. We praise you for it today. Lord, we come to say thank you, to give glory to you and honor to you and praise to you because you are Lord of all. There's nothing too difficult for you. There's nothing beyond your imagination. There's nothing hidden in darkness that you don't know. We praise you that we're not alone, that we're not isolated, that you secure our future. We give you glory today because you are worthy. You are worthy of all praise and honor and glory that your name may be lifted up, that your kingdom be extended. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Huh? You may have a seat. You can stand it. I hope you received an outline when you came in. If you're joining us online or in some other location, you can download that from the websites or the apps. It'll give you the scriptures we're going to use. It'll help you today. We've been doing a little study on the theme of God is moving, and I believe that. I believe the, the, the activity of God is more evident in recent months and years than at any time in my lifetime. Now, for fairness, I also have to say the expressions of evil seem to be more blatant and brazen than ever. I believe that fits a biblical pattern that we've talked about in other settings. I won't revisit that. So that it requires of us a purposeful, intentional focus on what God is doing. And you won't primarily get that from the, the typical news sources. Bad news tends to gather more attention, attract more clicks, and so most sources lead with news that is disruptive and frightening. You'll pay more attention to the weather reports if they sound some siren and tell you there's a storm headed your way than if they tell you it's going to be clear and sunny. So they warn us about storms that never come. Well, your opinion on that's not as relevant. It's just a fact. It's an observation. Bad news garners attention more quickly than good news. Because of that, we have to purposefully focus our attention and our thoughts to identify the good things that are happening. Because you'll just kind of assume you deserve those. You'll gobble them up and take them for granted and think, well, why don't I get more? Why don't we have more sunny, cool days? Why are there so many storms? And what I'm submitting to you is that God is moving, and if we're going to cooperate with him and participate with him and make the journey, we need to learn the characteristics of those seasons so we don't get caught up in the reporting that is not driven from a biblical worldview, has no intention of honoring a Judeo-Christian perspective. 
Their intent is to manipulate. So God is moving. I'm going to suggest in this session some, some characteristics for some new heroes. I think that would be helpful. But first of all, I want to start with a little window into another one of those seasons when God is moving. moving. We've been using up to this point the book of Judges, and we've been focused principally on Gideon. The book of Judges is a cycle. It's a cyclical book. The same thing happens over and over and over again. God's people living in his land under the blessings of his covenant, his watchful care, wander into the weeds of ungodliness. And when they do that, they forfeit the protection that comes from living in cooperation with God. And it gets very painful, and they cry out to God for mercy, and God raises up a deliverer, a judge. It's a cycle in the book of Judges. And quite candidly, it's a pattern throughout the history of the people of God, both the Old Testament, the New Testament. It's just as evident a cycle in the story of the church. Typically, the church is most effective when it has the most freedom and the most liberty and the most affluence. Amen, says the most free and affluent group of Christ followers the world has ever known. We should understand that makes us vulnerable. Well, in this session, I want to go to the New Testament, um, not because the character of God is any different, but in the city of Ephesus, the Spirit of God begins to move. And I believe we can some learn some things. That we might understand what it looks like in the cities where we live. The Bible gives us insight and understanding if we have the courage to read it. In Acts chapter 19, it describes Paul is in the city of Ephesus and he's been ministering. And the, the Jewish, one of the Jewish priests has seven sons. And they've observed what's been happening and they decide they want to get into the ministry. Not necessarily in an appropriate way in that they haven't necessarily yielded themselves to any authority. They just like the fireworks. You understand ministry is not principally about what's done in public. Ministry is overwhelmingly something that is personal. It begins from your relationship with the Lord. It begins from the relationships you have with the people around you. And to the extent that it becomes a public thing, it's a reflection of those other things. But in Acts 19, verse 14, there were seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest. And they were doing this. There were deliverance services. People with unclean spirits were finding freedom in Ephesus. So one day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Always makes me smile. Do you have the imagination that unclean spirits are aware of the persons and the personalities in the world? He said, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but you I'm not familiar with. <laughs> Warning. The man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. One man overpowers seven men. Somehow in the altercation, they lose their clothing. They're frightened enough they run through the streets in that condition. Not really clear how it happened, but somehow it stirred the city. I can understand it. I mean, I think in the community where I live, seven naked men that had been beaten and were bleeding running through the street <laughs> would probably get a comment. So they're, they're, the passages are separated in your notes, but it's one continuous story. The very next verse, verse 17 says, when this became known to the Jews and the Greeks. So it's, it's to the Jewish community and the non-Jewish community. When that story got repeated, they were seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Now some people will read that and say those seven sons were doing something they shouldn't have been. I'm not really arguing that point. They were certainly in over their heads, out of their depth. The personal trauma for them was significant. But God took that traumatic event and he caused it to create a fear of God in the community. In the name of Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. That's a very significant sentence. Many of those who believed, not the unbelievers, 
Not the pagans, not the people on the periphery, but amongst the believing community, there was a practice of ungodly things. And with an, ex with an extension, a growth of the fear of God and the name of Jesus being elevated in everybody's estimation, the believers came to repent of their ungodliness. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the totals came to 50,000 drachmas. Without doing a lot of cultural mathematics, it's millions of dollars. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. In that, in that little passage there, there are seven things identified with when God moves. And I think we should have some imagination that that's still a part of God moving in the earth. Ephesus is confronted with a spiritual reality. The reality of spiritual things in a very personal way, a tangible way, shook the city. Now the outcome of that is there was a segment of the, the community, both Jewish and non-Jewish, who gained a much greater fear of God. The name of Jesus was held in high honor. It's been a long time since we've seen that. We've been told not to mention his name. I am asked, when I go in public to say an invocation or a prayer of dedication, I have been asked in our community, this is like the buckle on the Bible belt, to not use the name of Jesus. So please don't be so naive as to think the name of Jesus is held in high esteem. Many of you work in places where you wouldn't go to work with Jesus on your clothing. It has to change. It's not always been the way. It isn't helpful. I don't imagine everybody's going to respect Jesus, that everybody wants to identify him, but why should he be banished from the public square, and why have we been silent when that happened? I don't understand. Then fourthly, it says, many believers began to openly confess their evil deeds. We've got to stop imagining that the wicked are the problem. It's the lukewarm people of God that is really the root of this. We are going to have to make some changes. And then there's public separation from ungodly behavior. They'll come in public and say, listen, I've been involved in some ungodly stuff. And I will make, this is number six, the financial sacrifice that's necessary for me to repent. Wow. We want private repentance. We want everything to be quiet. We don't want to be embarrassed by the fact that we've been living dual lives. And in Ephesus, the one thing that happened out of that old seven fellas story was this spoke public. And then the outcome is in verse 20. It says, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now, if we stopped there, I could probably motivate you into kind of a joyful, happy, woo-hoo, let's go. I mean, I could probably convince you we could have a bonfire this afternoon and you could find something to bring. And I'm not saying that's wicked, but that's not the whole story. Same chapter, verse 23. It says, about that time. So the same window with chronologies holding together here. This is the same story, same article, same summary. There arose a great disturbance about the way. Now, the way is simply a, a label for those who believe Jesus is the Messiah. There's a great disturbance about this in Ephesus now. And a silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, he brought in no little business for the craftsmen. So he called them together, along with workmen in related trades. He is mobilizing the unions. And I'm not being disparaging of the unions. I'm just telling you it's a significant group of people that he is mobilizing. Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. And you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus. And in practically the whole province of Asia, he says that man-made gods are no gods at all. 
Attaching labels to people that you don't agree with is not a new habit. Mobilizing public opinion to oppose what God is doing is not a new thing. Somehow, we have accepted the idea and we've been coached to it that our goal is to never cause confusion. That our presence should never be disruptive. That the message we have should always result in a group hug. And very clearly in Scripture, there's a difference of opinion. When Gideon did what God asked him to do, when the sun came up, the people of the community who knew him intended to kill him. In Ephesus, when God supernaturally began to move, there is a very coordinated effort of a broad section of the community that says what's happening is completely inappropriate. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited and the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and they began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So big picture. There's a, there's just a display of the power of God in Ephesus from a very unlikely source. Paul's been there ministering. This really wasn't elicited primarily from what Paul was doing. There's a demonstration of the power of God. And there is a, a, a remarkable response from the people in the city across all the boundaries that would have separated them, Jew and Gentile. Whether you worshiped in a synagogue or you worshiped in the temple of Artemis, there are Jews and Gentiles coming and saying, I've been involved in things I shouldn't be involved in. Publicly, I want to separate myself to the point that they destroyed millions of dollars worth of their possessions that they had used in ungodly ways. And on the heels of that, this person who's a silversmith, a man of enough prominence in the community that he could marshal the, a broad group of the community to agree with him, and he says, our livelihood is being threatened. If this continues, we're going to lose status. We, our place will be diminished. It will have an economic impact upon us. This cannot continue. So that the moving of the Spirit of God didn't result necessarily in overwhelming unity. It, re it resulted in a rather stark division. So I want to submit to you as, as one observation that when God begins to shake a community, the earth, a nation, that it tends to cause us to have to decide what we truly believe. There's a group of people publicly burning destructive things, spiritually unhealthy things, and there's another group of people who are furious and shouting, great is Artemis the, of the Ephesians. Now, that seems a little quaint to us. We can't imagine standing in the public square shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. But if you go home today or pause and look at your phone on the way home, you can find with very little effort some angry, furious group of people shouting from the river to the sea. And if you persist for a moment longer, you can find another group shouting that no one can tell me who to love. Or it's my body and my choice. Or somebody else shouting that an open border is an act of compassion or that parents shouldn't have authority over their children. Or on and on. And in the face of those angry shouts, the church seems confused addled a bit as if we've lost our balance and there's enough voices that saying that we should be a voice of unity that it's not always easy to understand so I want to take that Ephesians narrative and take the balance of our time and talk a little bit about cooperating with God what would that look like for you and me because at the end of the day this has to get personal you know, it's really easy for me to say the people in the White House need to do better. That the people in the House of Congress need to do better. 
But I'll tell you my most honest answer to that. I don't think it's appropriate to want the people in the White House to lead with a greater morality than we lead in our house. If we're not willing to deal with it in our house, then here's what we know in our house, that is difficult. It isn't easy because it brings stress and strain and life is messier than we would like it to be. And so we'd just rather not do that. We'll just overlook it. And we've been doing that for so long, for so many decades, that we've almost lost the muscle that's necessary. And we, we've become so familiar with it, we've become so familiar with the pattern that we elect all sorts of people that they'll just overlook anything if they can maintain their power. Because what you want to do in your home when you're overlooking it is you want to maintain the status quo. So I think we need a little um, recalibration on cooperating with God. In the previous session, I suggested essential to that is learning to listen. Not one time, not learning to listen so that you get saved and then you stop listening. But that you lead a life that reflects the little pattern I have submitted to you for a while now. Watch, listen, think, and act. If you're watch, listening, thinking, and praying, and you're leaving out acting, you're not cooperating. I'm an advocate for prayer. But I can't tell you how many people have taken that little phrase and they've cut off act. The point of watching and listening and thinking is so that we can act like Christ followers. That's the target. The second thing I want to submit is we're going to think about what it means for you and me to cooperate with God is it's going to require us, I believe, my opinion, to cultivate some new kinds of heroes. And when I say hero, I'm talking about the people whose lives we point at and go, wow. They're the people that we watch their lives, we think, you know, I'd, I'd like a big chunk of that to be the future for my kids or my grandkids. Amazing people. We celebrate them. Because the reality, whether you've done it consciously or not, is the people that you make heroes are the people that speak into your behavior. If you're not thinking about that, I promise you, your children are. Our heroes have changed a great deal. I have been around a bit. I remember a time when our heroes and, and Hollywood and the media and those public venues tend to help us shape those. You may have personal heroes. I'm not talking about them nearly as much as I'm talking about the ones that have higher profiles. Once upon a time, Hollywood cranked out movies that made heroes of military victories. There's a whole genre of movies, we call them westerns, and the typical pattern in, in, the, in those movies was the bad guy loses and the good guy wins. Primetime TV has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. A lot of things have changed. I'm not really bemoaning it, I'm just telling you there's a shift in what we make heroes of. The hero movies now that are being cranked out of Hollywood, I see them on airplanes. Because I'm scrolling through the list going, really? Most of them are, are, are very brilliantly presented presentations of cartoon characters. Our heroes now have capes and wear spandex. <laughs> because we're not championing things like patriotism and honor and sacrifice and dignity. So we don't make heroes out of those things. So I, I want to I push on that a little bit further with you, if you'll allow me. I'm going to use Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 9, we're, we're stepping into this narrative, and I'm introducing it to you backwards. I know that, but I think you know who Saul is, and you know a bit about his story, right? He's a Pharisee. He's angry at people who believe in Jesus. He hates them. He will imprison them, men or women or whomever else. He's murderous. And then Jesus comes for him. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus went back to heaven, but in Acts chapter 9, he's standing on the road to Damascus. And he has a message for one Saul of Tarsus. And after Saul has that Jesus experience, he goes on into Damascus, and that's where I step into your notes. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. Imagine that. He has a personal encounter with Jesus, and he begins to share the story and there are believers in Damascus. Ananias is one. He goes to see him. He's part of a community of believers there. So in the face of Saul's dramatic conversion instituted by Jesus himself, 
The response is murderous hatred directed at him. Again, that goes against the narrative that tip, tends to emerge from the people of faith today. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. This wasn't like some momentary emotional thing. They've got a scheme. They're going to shut him down. It will be harmful to the cause if his message goes out broadly. Let's kill him. But his followers said, Saul, you've got to change your message. You've got to become a little broader in your perspective. I'm sorry. That's in my imaginary Bible. It says his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, that's his home, that's his base of operations. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were afraid of him. He's a real enough threat that Peter, James, and John don't want anything to do with him. They don't want to be seen with him. They're afraid to be with him. That's a pretty strong statement. Not really believing that he was a disciple. They know his methods. They know he's deceptive. They know he's dishonest. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. You can turn your page. <laughs> now that, that passage was Acts 9, 23. I want to go back to the beginning of Acts chapter 9. I want you to read the attitude with which Paul left Jerusalem. And he headed to Damascus. It says, meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. That's Paul's mindset when he leaves Jerusalem. He meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. He goes on into the city blind. Ananias prays for him. His sight is restored. He begins to advocate for Jesus with such clarity that the same community that he represented is trying to assassinate him. And the believers have to sneak him out of town. What intrigues me is that when he goes to Jerusalem after that escape, he tried to join the disciples. He's got new heroes. His career is totally tied to the blessing of the high priest and the Pharisees. Everything about his education, every year he's invested, all the momentum of his existence, all of his future is invested in the blessing of those people. He is the rising star. He's the poster child. He's the lead story in their advertisements. And he's met Jesus. And like the people at Ephesus, he's burning whatever was a part of that old life. He's saying, listen, there's a cost to this. There's a sacrifice to this. But I'm going to separate myself from that. I need some new heroes. I need to go meet Peter and James and John. They're afraid of him. He didn't go back to the Sanhedrin and said, I want to give you my testimony. And it didn't soften it into language that was so... Difficult to understand that you don't know whether you're for it or against it. He's making new heroes. Saul completely realigned his life. You see, repentance means a change of thought and a change of behavior. Behavior and values change as an expression of repentance. Repentance is not saying, I'm sorry, I got caught. Can we mitigate the consequences? Repentance says, I was thinking wrongly and behaving badly, and I have changed how I think, and I'm going to walk a new direction. Now, if you'll allow me, I know it isn't universal, and I'm sure there are exceptions, but I'm going to suggest to you that our heroes have too often been people who lead ungodly lives. And we have given that to our families. We've helped with that. We've spent money to promote that.
because there were voices speaking to them that were helping shape their expectations and those external voices were more profound than the influence in our own homes. And it's really difficult to stand against that because there's disappointment and there's disruption and there's all sorts of stuff. And so rather than deal with that, we just think, well, I'll take them to church and we'll figure it out. And we've allowed heroes to form, values to be celebrated, behaviors to be looked up to. I, you know, I started making lists and I thought there's no end to this. One that's been pretty prominent lately, and I'm not trying to pick on anybody particularly, but Taylor Swift is like a phenomenon. She can change the ratings in the NFL. That's not easily done. And I don't know a great deal about her, but I don't have the sense that she's a poster child for a biblical worldview. But I'm not, I, you don't have to pick on her uniquely. Diddy's in trouble these days. You know, his scenario's not great. Talented, capable, amazing gifts, Lady Gaga. I mean, the list goes on on the Rolling Stones if you're older. We'll wear their merch. We'll celebrate them. We'll promote them. Gifted musically. Okay, gifted musically and ungodly. I'm picking on musicians. We could do the same thing amongst athletes. We could do the same thing amongst professional Christians. You see, we emulate the behaviors of ungodly people because they're our heroes. And it isn't helpful. And we do this in the church. I don't mean just this congregation. I mean the church in general. I would submit to you that Christian musicians should present differently than secular musicians. But because we aspire to that kind of success, churches have a few people in them, a few hundred people in them, and the secular musicians, the good ones, they play to almost untold numbers of people, and we aspire to that for ourselves or our children. So we want to act like that even if every once in a while we're singing Jesus. We're going to have to change our heroes. I don't believe ministers should look and behave in the same way as ungodly leaders. We have a message that's different. It's derived from a different authority. I have a question. Do we hold aspirations that our children serve the Lord? Do we imagine that that is a profession, as a, as a direction of their lives, as a utilization of their talents and their abilities to be a, a high expression of opportunity and potential for them? And I'm not suggesting everybody should. I don't believe that. But it seems to me that that's a diminished notion. Just the general notion of the helping professions. Once upon a time, there were whole professional classes of people who understood that to, to participate in them was a yielding of service to your life, meaning you would forfeit some things. Ministry was certainly one of those helping professions. So was health care. Long before we had big pharma and the government, there was so much money in health care that the government wanted it. Again, I'm not opposed to being compensated fairly for what you do. Teachers are a helping profession. Our first responders are helping professions. If you take that list, they have been systematically deconstructed, questioned in the public arena, told they're unimportant. We need them. We need our children to understand how valuable they are. My time's about gone. That's not good. I'll take a minute. I think we, we can take this one step further in cooperating with God and crafting these heroes. And I'm talking about you and me. It has to do with our expressions of belief and faith and faithfulness. Belief, faith, and faithfulness in the language of the New Testament, the Greek language, it's very clear they're all very closely related. You can't be a person of faith and be an unfaithful person. You can't be a person who believes and be a, an unfaithful person. They go together. So when, when I have this conversation about faith or belief, I'm really talking about the expression of that in faithfulness. It is not inconsequential when you choose to be unfaithful. Plain language. If you refuse to believe, if you refuse to cultivate belief, if you say, well, you know, I don't believe that, and you kind of shut the door and you're not willing to explore or listen or grow, there's a consequence to that in the kingdom. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 18, it says, To whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? 
So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. It's the Exodus generation he's talking about. Same, Numbers 14, it's the same group of people, very different locations in the Bible, but the same group of people. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? In spite of all the miraculous signs I've performed among them. What I would call your attention to is the momentum of unbelief. You see, if you start that ball rolling down the hill, well, I don't, that's not how I believe. That's not how we did it. Or you give yourself license to be less faithful. Less faithful to worship, less faithful to generosity and giving, less faithful to serving, less faithful. That gains momentum. Because it's much easier when you're two or three weeks out of the pattern to be four or five or six weeks out of the pattern. And it takes seven or eight weeks to establish a good pattern. There's a momentum to unbelief, and it leads to the forfeiture of God's future. That's what God said. How long will they refuse to believe? And the New Testament commentary in Hebrews 3 is they weren't allowed to enter in. They left Egypt. The message came to them as slaves in Egypt. I am here to deliver you, to take you to a land that flows with milk and honey. And God's commentary on them is you are stubborn in your unbelief. So suggestion. Let's not do that. Let's decide to become a people willing to be tutored by the Spirit of God. Let's be a people who will grow in our belief, who will grow in our faithfulness. The grand deception that I think has contributed to our paralysis is the idea that you're born again and you're going to heaven and nothing else matters. Now, for clarity, I'm an advocate for the new birth. In the same way I celebrate the birth of a child. But I understand when I look at the newborn child that the future is yet before it. It has not lived fully. When I celebrate the new birth in the life of a person, a spiritual birth, I understand that the opportunity is before them, not fully experienced. So the alternative to being less faithful with a diminished belief is to encourage one another, help one another to be believers. Look at Hebrews 3.12. I've skipped in your notes just a bit. It's under B. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart. You thought being unfaithful in an unbeliever was value neutral. That's not the biblical description. It's sinful. That turns away from the living God. The alternative, encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin, sin's deceitfulness. We need that encouragement. The voices that speak to you to give you license to be ungodly, to be immoral, to tell you you can choose your own path, that you're better than most people, that you're not that or that, those voices are numerous and loud and unrelenting. They're in the literature we read, in the media we watch. I mean, they're, they're just almost endless. And there are very few places that will give to you a biblical perspective with clarity. So if you choose people in your sphere of influence that will encourage you towards godliness, that is profound. Who love you enough to say, this is a better way. And then you need them to love you enough to say, come walk this way. We need one another. In fact, it says we have to encourage one another. How often? Daily. We leak. And the adversary, you know, how often do you bathe? Occasionally. When I'm in the mood. If I have time. If I recognize the need. Hopefully, the only time you bathe isn't when someone does an intervention and says, thou stinkest. 
We'll encourage one another, not just at that point of intervention where it's desperate and the rest of us can't bear it. Encourage one another. Any good thing you see happening, you blessed me with that. That was helpful for that. I'm going Saturday night to the festival. Why don't you come go with me? Oh, I don't like to sit outside. Oh, come help me. I don't like it either. It'll help me stay if you go. Encourage one another. Stop encouraging wickedness. Stop making heroes out of the ungodly. Stop saying wicked people are good people. You can say they're talented people. You can say they have some amazing gifts. They have some abilities that you don't have, but I don't want their future. And if being that is necessary to get to where I see them standing, I'm choosing another path. Encourage one another. Jesus gave us the nuts and bolts of it in a little parable. It's the parable of the sower, you know it. Farmer sowing seed, four kinds of ground. Only one of the four has a good outcome. Jesus' disciples didn't understand. They weren't the brightest in the box. So they asked for a private explanation, and Jesus gives it to them. I gave you two categories. They're germane to our conversation. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the one who hears the word and receives it with joy. Not grumpy, not angry, not stubborn, not with gritted teeth. They receive it with joy. That was awesome. Spoke to me, ministered to me, tears. But they have no root and they last only a short time. Because when trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, the assumption in Jesus' explanation is that because of the word of God, because of your faithfulness, because of your belief system, that trouble and persecution will emerge. If you don't expect it, if you don't anticipate it, you're caught off guard and you're not prepared. Jesus anticipates it as a part of the journey. You hear the word, you receive the word, trouble and persecution will present. Well, I don't like that. Duly noted. When you see the king, have the conversation. In the interim, prepare yourself. The alternative is in verse 23. The one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop. Jesus said that the differentiation, you can receive it with joy and great emotion and not hold it because the persecution robs you of it. The good soil is the person who actually has productivity because of it. There's a transformation in their behavior. So what you and I want to do is become more than accumulators of information. We want our lives to reflect that relationship. It's a change. It's a fruitfulness. I've been talking for two sessions about recognizing what the presence of God brings to a life or a community or a group of people. Not language, not religious words, but the fruit of the presence of the Spirit. Because I desperately want myself to be good soil in God's economy, and I desire that for you. So here's my invitation. Let's take the two primary components we've looked at when God's moving. There's a willingness to repent. There's a, there's a growth with that of the fear of God, a respect and a reverence for God. And then there's a willingness to ask God to bring a new effectiveness to our lives. So if you're in either of those two camps, and it may be both, you may need to repent and say, I want to be more effective. And what I would really ask you to do is give the Holy Spirit permission to say, if there's anything in me that is limiting my effectiveness, if there's any place I've been unfaithful, we're not always unconscious. We're not always willing, stubborn, resistant, rebellious people. But you know, I've learned in my life, any endeavor you pick up, if you're gonna move from being a novice to somebody of greater excellence, there is continued refinement. Right, if you've never exercised at all and you go to the gym and say, I wanna exercise, they'll give you one regimen. If you've worked out six days a week for six years and you go to the gym and say, I wanna improve, they're gonna give you a completely different regimen. And many of us have not given the Holy Spirit permission to say, is there anything I could do to make a difference in my effectiveness? Because we've been holding up our credentials for the new birth. 
You with me? So are you willing to give the Holy Spirit that permission today? Go into training? Woohoo! God's moving, folks. Let's go with him, huh? Why don't you stand with me? Father, I thank you for your word, for its truth and authority and power in our lives. I thank you that you're moving in the earth, that you haven't stepped away from us, that you haven't condemned us, but that you have made a way that we might be restored and reconciled to you. And we come today in humility. Lord, any place where we have been willingly, purposefully living in compromise or tolerating ungodliness, Lord, we repent. We will not call good that which you have called wicked. And we will not bless those things that you have stepped away from. Forgive us. Lord, we all come today to ask that by your spirit, you would guide us, lead us, show us those places where we can cooperate with you more fully, where we can align ourselves with you more completely, where we can take our place in your purposes as you're moving in this generation. Lord, we don't want to step back. We don't want to be stubborn in our unbelief. We don't want to excuse our unfaithfulness. We want to cooperate with you as fully and as completely as we know how. I thank you for it. We praise you for what you will do. And we will be careful to give you the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.